everybody. Welcome to Pale in Comparison. In this podcast, my sister uses her knowledge of the other verse to take a look at Pact, while those least appreciated work, and I try to not give away any spoilers. I'm Jenny, and Malia convinced me to read Worm. I'm Malia, and Jenny convinced me to read everything else. This episode, we are answering your questions. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to issue a spoiler warning. This podcast is filled with pale spoilers. It will also contain packed Arc 1 spoilers and some spoilers for the Parahuman stories. But don't worry, we'll warn you when to skip ahead before we talk about Parahuman's content. Yay, we get to talk about ourselves! Woo! <laughs> Woo! Not just about ourselves, but more about our thoughts about stuff. Um, yeah, so we will continue with our normal podcast next week. Um, we just had a lot of good questions, and it was going to take up way more time than we had to try to go over the questions. So we just decided to make our own episode for it. So, yeah. And to make it up for you, we will hopefully have some fun extra bonus content dropping in your feeds Woo. this week. That's right. So, so Woo. Uh, get excited, <laughs> guys. Get pumped. It's going to be super <laughs> awesome. All right. <laughs> so we have a couple of different categories of questions. First is... I guess other verse questions. Then we have some parahuman questions and then a couple about ourselves. So we're going to go ahead and start with the other verse ones. So we'll start with Bavarian Barbarian who asks, do you think Rose Senior had girl power? I mean, obviously that's, that's where her shoes come yeah. in, right? You can't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first shoes that freaking sweet, like you got to have some girl power for sure. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, she got the D, like, for sure. Um, <laughs> let me see. So Bavarian Barbarian also asks, um, do you think she effectively utilized girl power by binding demons to use as weapons of mutually assured destruction and a generation's long standoff with the other powers in Jacob's Bell? I kind of think so. I mean, this is not morally great, but not all women are, like, morally great or perfect angels or whatever. Mm -mm. Um, women can be shitheads as well. And I think that, like, when I think about history and stuff, like, I think about women gaining as much power and agency as they can and, like, doing things that they're not always, like, recognized for. And I think that it is, like, weirdly girl power to be like, all right, like, I got to do this to survive and I'm going to do it the best I fucking can. Well, for sure. <laughs> what do you think, Jen? No, I agree. Um, yeah, I kind of, my main thought that I wrote down here is a note. Um, which I feel like I should have written more. But I was just like, I wonder what a feminist demon would look like. Like, just straight up, like, I don't know. Kill all men? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not very f actual feminist, but... No, but, yeah, let's not kill all men, people. <laughs> okay? Like, men are great. So, yeah, let's just be nice to people on Earth. <laughs> um, so, Megafire7 asks, for Malia... What do you think Blake's practice will end up looking like, given his personality? Um, I'm thinking kind of gritty. Blake and Rose remind me of, like, two halves of Verona. Rose seems to be really good with words, really adept, really careful. And, um, like, the way she dealt with the fairy, she really just was like, yeah, here's some weird bullshit, and it worked. Whereas Blake seems to, like, really, like, fly by the seat of his pants, um, reminding me of, like, Verona drawing a diagram and being like, haha, this will work, like, and throwing her hat or whatever. Maybe a little bit more of, like, I don't know, the spirits might roll with it, like, let's just do it kind of a side. So I think that, like, they are two halves of an extremely talented practitioner, which is real exciting to see. I also think, though, that he's going to have to work with demons at some point because, like, I don't know, I feel like you can't put demons in a book and then have, like, this man incredibly desperate for, like, any sort of power source because he needs to survive and have it not happen. I don't know. But so, yeah, I, I don't know if he'll ever accept that he's a diabolist. I don't think he's going to like it or want to do it. And there is a possibility that he's just going to be, like, pushed right up to the edge and then be like, nope, I can't. Like, not doing it. Mm. Okay. So Megafire7 also asks for both of us. What do you think the other's practice would look like? So what do I think Jenny's practice would look like? And what does Jenny think my practice would look like? Okay, everyone knows what Malia's practice would look like. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> Malia is going to be a karmic law practitioner. Or my other idea was maybe 
if there's such a thing an other law practitioner, like helping mm-hmm. others like navigate around practitioner shenanigans. I could kind of see it. That would be awesome. <laughs> So for Jen, I was trying to think, um, Jen's really into, like, serial killer stories. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I mean, it is interesting, but, like, well, I know, mean, I'm not trying to kill just, people over here. Just make that clear. Yes. You've always found the, the <laughs> stories really interesting, and you've always found you were interested in, like, forensic nursing and just forensic science in general. Mm-hmm. And I was like, but I don't think you'd be, like, an investigator. Like, I don't really see you out there, like, looking for clues or whatever. But then, based on a conversation we have in an episode that we've already recorded, maybe an echoist. Echoes are really cool. And okay. it's like putting pieces together and finding out about past events that have happened. Or like necromancer because uh, dead people and the human body <laughs> is cool. Um, hmm. Hopefully necromancers don't have to be bad. I mean, I'd have to learn about more what necromancers do. I mean, it doesn't really Same. give me a positive vibe. <laughs> but like... I mean, I don't know, like... <laughs> well, like, in medical school, you have to, like, dissect a corpse, you know? Yeah. Like, they didn't go out and kill it, but, like, they're learning about things to help them learn and, like, do good things for the human body. And I'm thinking more in terms of, like, using your knowledge of the human body and your interest in, like, death <laughs> <laughs> to better the lives of other people. That's fair. Okay. All right, now we come to bisexual punch party. Um, If you had to choose one of the three major rituals, would you pick implement, domain, or familiar? So I can't decide where I want to live at all. So I was automatically just like, no, not domain. I mean, Mm. I I would want one eventually. It seems cool, but not right now. And so implement or familiar, um, the implement ritual seems really useful in terms of defining yourself, but it also seems like it kind of maybe puts you in a little bit of a box. Like Lucy's practice is really affected by her implement and i don't feel ready for that at all so i think familiar i would want to make my cat my familiar i love her so much <laughs> she's a pretty cat. she she's so wonderful and i want her to live as long as i do and the fact that she's not going to like honestly just makes me randomly start crying sometimes <laughs> she's also like chronically ill like it's she basically has like ibs or something and so she like has a lot of problems with eating and all this stuff. And I just love her so much. (laughs) And I would be bonded to my cat for life. She is probably the sweetest cat that I've seen. She's very sweet. (laughs) Um, for me, it's kind of, it's a close call between implement and domain for me. It's familiar. would be awesome, but I'm already married, you know, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Not to say I couldn't have a familiar, but um, I don't think I have. I, I don't have any pets. I don't have a connection to anything right now that's that strong, like to my husband. Um, I'd probably honestly choose the domain, partially because I actually own a house. So that really helps. <laughs> um, kind of hard to have a domain if you don't have some kind of property. I, I really like the idea of having my own sanctuary um, and mm. having a place to just like keep me and my family safe from harm. Like, no matter what, I can just bring my family in there and just say, like, fuck off, evil. You know, you're not getting at my baby or a man, you know. <laughs> I mean, could have it just be, like, some huge, like, relaxation space. Get a massage chair in there. Lavender scented candles. It'd be super sweet. That's what I'm saying. Um, I mean, I guess if I was a necromancer, maybe it couldn't really be quite like that. Probably be more deathy. Um <laughs> But, but you no, know, like, be what you want. We don't like boxes in Wild Bill. You're right. You know, like, if I want a necromancy, like, massage parlor, like, as my domain, you know, who's to stop me? That's what I could do. I could raise people and, like, have them, like, I don't think I'd want to be massaged by some dead corpse, but, you know, I don't think I would choose being a necromancer anyway. But so who knows? Maybe if I chose that, who knows where my life's going to go. It's not what I expected to be talking about <laughs> during this question, <laughs> but yeah. We've got Beard of Valor, who starts off saying, I wrote a lot. Feel free to answer as few as you want. <laughs> but darn it, we're going to answer some, some of these questions, dang it. Yes. Um, so 
I see. Knowing what you do about Pale, and blind as you are to the future of Pact, Simulia, why are things so contentious in Jacob's Bell? Like, is Jacob's Bell the norm, or Kennet, or the BHI, or are they all special cases? Yeah, so it seems to me like Kennet is especially as unusual that um, it's been tried before, but in general, like... Like, I think there are places where practitioners don't exist and there are others, but I don't think that there are necessarily many places where, like, practitioners don't exist and there are others, like, who are forming a governing structure to try to maintain that, Um, Mm -hmm. especially within, like, a town, like a place where people live. I think BHI is also somewhat unusual, but it seems like maybe things are going in this direction. Like, it's, I feel like I don't have a good sense of how many of the practitioner families in this region of Canada are sending their kids to the school if it's like 1% or if it's like 75%, you know, but it seems like maybe practitioners don't want to share power. I, I don't really see Jacob Spell having a nice little school that the demon kids can come to or whatever. But on oh, the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, like they, you know, the BHI seems like new, but like it'll probably be much more normal soon. So Jacob's Bell just strikes me as, like, not incredibly unusual. It seems like it was a small town that has this, like, deep history, right? And a lot of fairly proficient practitioner families, but not, like, incredibly powerful practitioner families have lived there. And, like, as they've gotten stronger, like, they've all kind of, like, gotten better at the practice at the same rate. So none of them has, like, come out ahead. And it's not, like, a big enough of a deal for, like, a really powerful lord to want to take over, But they're also, like, not weak enough that anyone could waltz in and just take over. Like, it's it's this kind of delicate balance. Yeah, it doesn't, it seems like they, similarly to Kennet, want to avoid attention from the outside because they've been, like, growing recently. They don't want someone else to, like, come in. And there's this, like, delicate status quo in the town. Okay, awesome. So, let me see. They go on to ask, again, um... If you thought Blake was morally and ethically on the same page as you and confirmed it with truth, capital T, do you think your advice could improve his position? What information would be the most valuable to him? I think like right now I'd be like, hey, get Rose out of the mirror world, figure out what what's up with Rose and then like make her your familiar Um, because I think that he needs like they need a power source. And I mean, depending on how Rose's power source works. I think that's a good option. I mean, I think that like if finding Rose as a familiar, isn't going to help her or like help both of them become stronger. Maybe it's not really as worth it, but it seems like that's the easiest of the big three rituals for them to do at this point, because it's just Mm. like, there's another sitting right there (laughs) who you're going to live with for the rest of your life anyway. Mm. I don't know. Um, I also think that like make friends uh, like try to make some connections with some of the people in this town. That's like, a rough one. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. I mean, I just think that like trying to be big and scary isn't going to work. So yeah, they also ask if Rose took a path from the mirror world to our world, which would be the worst one or best one? What kind of boons do they need most? It's a tricky question, but a good question. Yeah, this one was exciting. I got to go remember what some of the paths they've talked about are. I settled on the Shining Bridge as the best path for getting out of the mirror world. I'm pretty sure this is the path that Lucy and Avery and Verona take to go back to the BHI where they see Miss. So it's described as like being a good way to get from our world to alternate planes slash from alternate planes to our world and i'm like well that's perfect um it's also like they let little kids do it like it's all paths are risky but this one is like not that bad it seems like the downfall of this one is like there might not be really good boons associated with it um i wasn't really sure but it seems like the like less difficult paths are less beneficial um Hmm. but it would get rose out and like maybe they don't need a lot of risk right now (laughs) I mean, I think, though, like, if you're just going for boons, they need power and they need better karma. I don't know if there's some, like, 
very orderly geometric boring path that would take a long time <laughs> but result in like a bunch of karma because like i'm still struggling with karma it's not about right and wrong like you know it's not about like i don't know um it's about doing what the spirits think is like orderly or something mm-hmm. or if there's a path that has a huge power boost at the end that might be really good but also don't do it rose because i want you to live uh slash not become lost All right. They also ask, last but not least question from them, other than John, which other impale would be most likely to take the form of a dog or rat? Could you alter a ritual to select a different animal for for a dog of war? Um, Yeah, I was thinking the goblins, maybe cherry pop or something would be a rat. Um, I could also see Big G as a dog, like a really like Clifford dog. A Clifford Uh, dog. (laughs) A giant red dog. Exactly. Oh when my he god! <laughs> no, wait. Actually, okay, wait though. Now I really want John to become the Carmine dog because, like, it just be Clifford. Oh my god, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez! Can you imagine, like, Clifford, dog of war? Well, then isn't Jeremy's last name Clifford? And people are like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I honestly don't remember, but there's got, that that is are we? I think, I think we just learned a, that. Are we sensing a bold and specific prediction coming, Malia? Uh, that Jeremy and John are gonna fuse into one body and become the Carmine dog. I mean, you heard it here <laughs> first, folks. <laughs> yep. <Yeah>, okay. Ah. <laughs> uh. Um, I mean, that's why it's bold and specific predictions. It doesn't say bold and accurate, okay? It's just specific and bold. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I don't fully understand how the familiar thing works. I think it seems like maybe others can choose what animal they turn into. So presumably you could be like, hey, I know you're a dog of war, but turn into something else. And they'd be like, sure, I don't know. Like, um, screw you, I'm a dog. Screw you, I'm a dog. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe you shouldn't do dog stuff if you're a practitioner in Jacob's Bell. Okay, my turn to ask a question. We got a question from, oh my gosh, AJ DL DeBrudy. And they asked us who our favorite is of the trio in Pale. We're not going to tell you. <laughs> Because we are going to be, I mean, uh, I don't think this is a secret. I don't know. We're going to be guests on Pale Reflections soon. And so we will tell you then because that's one of their standard questions for guests. So they also ask, who is your favorite character in Pale, excluding the trio? And I want to specify to Jenny, this is rude because um, she hasn't written down any practitioners that she likes. But I want to say who's your favorite other and who's your favorite practitioner. Oh, fair enough. I mean... I was going to write down my favorite practitioner, but I was going to write the exact same thing you did. And so I was <laughs> like, well, um, all right. So basically, <laughs> um, uh, the other, it's so hard, but like the first one that came to mind was Miss, just because she's amazing. She pretty much set things up and I mean, she's just, she, she has her shit together. It's great. I definitely have a soft spot in my heart for John because he's amazing. Also Tashlet. Cause she's just seems great. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree with Malia's selections too, but I feel like I can't copy everything. That she <laughs> says. Um, practitioner. Malia already put this, but I agree. Uh-huh. So I'm going to say it as well. Um, probably Zed just cause he's, he's just pretty great. Brie and Nicolette are pretty close mm-hmm. as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, uh, I mean, I don't know. Thinking about it. I do like Liberty. Like, mm-hmm. I really like Liberty. She's wonderful. I don't know. There's there's so many just, like, delightful characters in the story. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I had to nail it down. Miss and Zed. So, for me, it's Tashlet. I just, like, adore her. But then also Snowdrop. It was Snowdrop before Tashlet. I don't know if it's just, like, still too much work to figure out what Snowdrop's trying to say or is saying. <laughs> um, but I just love Tashlet so much. And then for practitioner, yeah, okay, I wait. Put Zet. What you're you're saying? It's hard to understand what Snowdrop's saying when you're talking about Tashlet. 
Yeah, if I was there, it would be much harder to understand what Tashla is saying. But because I have people like Verona to just like translate what's going on in the text, it's much <laughs> easier <laughs> while reading to understand Tashla. I guess. Although <laughs> technically you also have Avery there to tell what Snowdrop's saying most of the time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, if you were stuck in a room with Tashlet and Snowdrop, <laughs> I'm just saying, one of them would definitely be easier to communicate with, and I'm not voting Tashlet on that, <laughs> unless it's That's Albie's right. dream room. Oh, but That was so lovely. Oh, mm. also, shout out to Monty, because he's so great. Oh, yeah, he's wonderful, too. He's yeah, wonderful. Oh, I love him so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're all so good. <laughs> yeah, and so then for practitioner, I said, probably Zed. He's great. He was the first person that made me like excited about going to the VHI and excited about like practitioners in general, just because he's so lovely and warm and like so cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I also really love Nicolette. Her interlude really like made me really sympathetic for her and she's awesome. But it's interesting seeing like her play off of some of the other practitioners that we've come to really love, like Liberty later on, because she's much more like, no, Liberty, don't touch my stuff. And it's kind of like, OK, I get it. But also disappointed, I guess. Like, the Kenna Tears would have let Liberty touch her stuff. And way Pecker's not. Mm -hmm. But consistency of character, I guess. Yeah. Um. Okay, so then AJ DL DeBrudy has one more question. What type of practitioner and or other would you like to be? Malia, I swear, if you don't say karmic law practitioner... Like, what <laughs> the hell? <laughs> um, for me, I honestly was thinking um, slightly different lines than what Malia was thinking. <laughs> but I, I do like forensic science. Um, that's what I wanted to do before I became a nurse. I actually was interested in the investigative aspect of it. But before nursing school, I did a little bit of study in environmental toxicology um, not much, to be honest, but I did a little bit of study in it, and I found it very fascinating. Um, so, I don't know. I feel like there probably, I don't know if there is such a thing, but I'm just going to act like there is. Maybe some kind of toxicology slash healer practitioner that maybe deals with some magic items, because I like the idea of magic items and things like that. Um we can throw some alchemy in there if that makes sense. You know, that's cool. <laughs> but I mean, I feel like learning about like toxins and poisons and things are really interesting. But I also like applying that. Well, maybe not applying poisons, but like I like the healing aspect of like my job and just, I don't know. It seems like it's useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's what I'd probably say. What about you, Malia? Yeah, I mean, hopefully karmic law practitioner, but... I don't know what that means. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably that. Also, maybe dreamer of paths or um, a textualist. I was going through the domain text again to find a bunch of examples of practitioners. And these two were like schools, uh, school of realms. And I was thinking that maybe I don't know if dreamer of paths is just another name for finder. It didn't seem like it. I was thinking it'd be cool if they like created paths with their dreams and or were like dream walkers or whatever, but sounds fun. I mean, I actually wouldn't want to be a finder, so maybe I wouldn't want to be a dreamer of paths, but if I could design mm -hmm. paths, that'd be cool. doesn't seem like that's how it works. Um, <laughs> and then um, I don't know what a textualist is. Actually, a textualist was not a uh, school of realm. That was something else, but it's kind of a joke but also sounds kind of cool. Um, textualism is a <sighs> judicial principle that is often used by conservatives and ignored by them when it comes to things like uh, Bostock, which was the recent trans employment case. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that you need to look just at the text and like literally nothing else matters. So it doesn't matter what the legislator later intended, what they thought was going on, like different like contexts surrounding things, uh, different policy arguments. Like you're just supposed to look at the text and then go from there, which often produces more conservative outcomes, but not always, which is why there's something called originalism, which is where you take the text and you interpret it using the original public meaning of the words. So not what 
the people who wrote it wanted it to mean or thought it meant, but what an average man on the streets of Philadelphia in 1789 would have thought the Constitution meant. It's dumb. <laughs> anyway. Um, but textualism is actually a I really strong say, and useful argument. Sorry, this is not an and important reason to interrupt you. But <laughs> no, go for it. I just... I don't know. Every time I hear like streets of Philadelphia or something like that, I think of like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yes. Yes. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'd be more down to know what Will Smith thought of the Constitution and follow his interpretation mm-hmm. um, than a lot of <laughs> other people. Um, That's fair. But yeah. So I was thinking about others. I don't. I don't want to be another. If I had to like turn into another. Maybe a fairy, because the other one I thought of was a ghoul, and I don't want to be a ghoul. It's interesting those are the two that you thought of. (laughs) For turning into? Yeah. Hmm. I don't think I can turn into a goblin. I mean, put your mind to anything, and you can be anything you want. You probably wouldn't want to be a goblin anyway, so. Uh, A fairy or cool. I mean, it just seems like you can't ever trust anyone, but I don't know. Okay. Um... But if I was, like, made as an other, it could be cool to be, like, an incarnation. Like, I want to be the incarnation of chill. Like, that'd be fucking <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Would you come and hang out with my, like, in my lavender candle domain? Yes, yes. Yes. That'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> While Buzz, like, rolling his eyes, he's like, you guys did not, like, get the idea of what I was trying to get. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but sorry. All right. So our next question um, from Discord, Heavenly Scarification, um, also known as Kippos from Pace, which is an amazing podcast. So Um, good. It's so freaking good. So that's kind of exciting to get a question from her. (laughs) Um, But she basically says, um, Pale seems to be wrestling with quite a few ideas, um, including how society treats those who have been imprisoned, um, how people can otherize to other people, um, letting themselves feel little to no guilt about atrocities Mm -hmm. or participate in those atrocities, as well as general discrimination and segregation of those other individuals, etc. There's always a lot. (laughs) So she was asking, um, do you feel like PACT is wrestling with any ideas, kind of similar to that, um, or just any ideas in general? Um, If so, what ideas do you think PACT is taking a look at and where do you feel like the book will land on these ideas? Yeah, so this is a really good question and also makes me feel a little stressed out. Like in mm. We've Got Worm, it seemed like Scott was so good at predicting what was happening because he was really good at picking out themes and extrapolating from there. And I was just like, how are you doing this? So we're, we're going to try. Okay. Um, <laughs> it seems like one of the things that I can see is like outsider status and like privilege thinking about what a Blake and Rose and um, Blake was, you know, homeless and treated really horribly by his family. But then like Rose is an other and she's trapped. Hmm. And like, I've speculated a little bit. I can't remember, honestly, y'all sorry if these episodes have come out yet, but you'll hear it soon um, about <laughs> Blake maybe being more sympathetic to others because of some of the experiences he's had as like, being seen as like inhuman by people while he was mm. homeless mm-hmm. um or unhoused i need to learn the the new the is there a new terms. term i think people sometimes people say people experiencing homelessness and then sometimes people say unhoused um ah, okay yeah i don't think i've heard that but i believe you yeah but then there's also like a little bit about like the public versus like like a tyranny of the majority thing almost maybe um like Blake's house and his family are like standing in the way of this town progressing and all these people are like we want you to get rid of your house what are you doing um and like should this one family through like their ownership of this land be able to stand in the way of that and like the law says yes but uh and like we're on Blake's side but mm-hmm. um that's an interesting thing. And then the other big thing it feels like is like the status quo and like historical, like the history of this town. Uh, Like, so Johannes feels kind of like new money 
Like he's come in and he's like flashing and has all this like power and everyone's like, who's this guy? Like he doesn't really belong here. Like he's a threat. Um, and then like Maggie and they're like totally dismiss her because she like hasn't been around forever, even though like Maggie's probably much more powerful and definitely much more knowledgeable than like Blake and Rose at this point. Right. But the Thorburns like have more clout than Maggie does because like they are more established presence. I mean, also like demons are scary, I guess, but it's it feels like maybe they're going to flip some of this like Baham, um Duchamp bullshit. And there's something that seems like inherently unfair about like inheriting this karmic debt. Uh, I don't know if it's like breaking the cycle of demon shit or uh, what, but hmm. yeah, those are some thoughts. Do you have thoughts? <laughs> That art's playing. Well, no, well, yeah, I didn't want to answer it just because, for one, I'd have to think. Um, no, <laughs> no, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to spoil anything um, or look into anything in that detail because of that. I mean, I feel like you've hit it pretty well on the nose from what we've seen so far. Um, so, yeah, I don't have anything coherent or worthwhile to add to that. <laughs> I think you're too hard on yourself sometimes. I feel like you do a good job. That, Like, even if, I mean, whether or not you have correct, like, predictions all the time, which, you know, nobody does. Like, you are very good at being in depth with, you know, um, your analysis. So, um, thanks. Yeah. So, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> all right. So, we've got stuck in Reddit factory, which, shocker, um, back to Reddit for that. <laughs> Um, uh, they are asking, um, so asking Malay again, um, I'm asking this specifically because you have only the earliest hints of the story, but if I asked you to picture one bold, specific and detailed picture of anything in the big finale of Pact, what would you come up with? I mean, this is real hard, y'all, because I feel like there's demons, right? And like, you can't just have a bunch of demons sitting around and never use them. But, like, Blake's a really good person, and I don't think he wants to, but I kind of think he's going to be, like, forced into it. Or, like, maybe he's, like, Rose is going to be taken or something, and he's going to be like, I have to do this or something. Hmm. Um, but I I don't think he'll want to. I mean, like, for, like, a big specific prediction, I feel like Blake and Rose will die in, like, a sacrifice sort of thing. But I don't like that. I mean, I'm sorry if that ends up happening. I hope that I like it when it happens. <laughs> But I feel like that that feels kind of like Harry Potterish to me. A big, bold specific detail picture. Um, I think that they'll. I know it's hard to come up with a. Big... It's not D and D, right? Like I'm like, oh, they're gonna have some huge battle, but like, why? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be like the end of like, what is it, the Avengers franchise, where like everybody just storms out, and there's like. I don't even remember how many people, but like a stupid amount of people storming the fields. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, we know Wildbo like is into Marvel after the <laughs> <laughs> fourteen dot twelve. Yeah. Yes. Um. Maybe. I think that a big okay one big bold specific detailed picture. I don't think the world's gonna end, and I don't think. That there are going to be lots of demons everywhere, like fucking people over. I don't think that those things are going to happen. Okay, so there'll be <laughs> some. So there'll be demons that get used in some kind of way, but somehow it's not going to fuck everything up entirely. There'll be some kind of resolution for something. Yeah, and also like, like this isn't a story about the end of the world. It might be a story about the end of Blake and Rose's life, but it it feels like. Like, okay, brief spoilers for parahumans, y'all. Unlike Worm, mm -hmm. this story does not feel like it encompasses the whole world. Um, yeah. This story feels like it is very much isolated to the futility of trying to exist as a practitioner under these specific circumstances. And I don't see this spreading much beyond this village or town. And so I think most of the consequences of this story are going to remain within and around Jacob's Bell. Okay. Um, which means that, like, the hordes of hell or whatever can't, like, ascend and 
I mean, maybe they can destroy Jacob's Bell, but it can't really go beyond that. All right. That's fair. I like it. Okay. Um, Captain Rhino asks, what is your current whodunit theory for Pale? Well, sorry, guys. We ain't going to tell you this time. Um, (laughs) For the same reason we mentioned earlier, um, we are going to save that for Pale Reflections. We will give you some mini little theories that we kind of came up with that like they're kind of it's it's like they maybe could happen but they're also not very serious theories and they're not whodunit theories just kind of a light-hearted theory for each of the trio yes yeah um i was thinking that lucy is maybe going to go into community organizing or um maybe go to law school i think that lucy is like very into obviously like advocating for the rights of others and she wants to Mm -hmm. find a non-violent but effective way to do that and i think that she would do really well in law school and she would make a really amazing like civil rights lawyer or like lawyer working in like legal aid or something like that but i could also see her being like no fuck the system um and going Mm -hmm. into something more like community organizing but that's that's my theory for lucy okay i think Avery, this is not quite as far in the future, probably. Um, she got those gardening gloves, right? And I'm blanking on the name of the path. The, but in, in the relatively new path um, around where they did the familiar ritual. So she got the gardening gloves from the nice flower lady other. I think she's going to use those gloves to start an amazing flourishing garden for food. It's going to give her internal peace as well as external peace because I'm guessing her family is not going to be hanging around her garden all the time. So she's going to get some peace and quiet. It's going to be a little bit of tranquility for her. Hmm. That's what I'm guessing. Last but not least, because we're all wondering, you know, what's Verona's domain going to be like? Um, A lot of people have said, like, um, possibly, I'm blanking on the term, but the internal domain that was kind of touched on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's been some people that have talked about how they think that's going to be it. That might be right. It might sound more plausible than what I'm going to say. But I think Verona's Domain is going to be a cat cafe slash bookstore. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, like, what better place for Verona? Come on, guys. Literally none. Literally. Yeah. Like, that is, like, that is like the anti-stress place for her. Sure. Maybe it's not the best place for others to hang out because there's so many cats, but she freaking loves cats guys. Mm -hmm. It's, it's got, I mean, it it just, it just makes sense to me. Yeah. So then captain Rhino asks, what's your favorite joke whodunit theory for pale? So we wrote down one um, that was like, I mean, obviously everyone knows about the cherry pop one. That's definitely an amazing one, especially since it's kind of canon, (laughs) at least in terms of the dream. Um, That's amazing. I kind of came up with my own. We've been trying to brainstorm a lot of whodunit theories um, to go over. Also to go to Pell Reflections and go over. This is one that didn't quite make the cut, (laughs) but I still kind of like it. So I'm going to tell you guys. Basically, we're going to find out at the end of the story, and I, this is very, like, tropey and cliche, but I don't care. Um, we're going to find out at the very end, this whole story was an Alpy dream that is in Brett's head. <laughs> okay, so this is when he's still married, things mm-hmm. are still going okay, mm-hmm. and Alpy's like, I see some stuff going in the wrong direction, I need to put some stuff straight, so I'm going to give this guy, like, a crazy intense very bold and specific nightmare so that he knows if he doesn't get his shit together, what's going to happen. And hopefully this is a wake up call. Literally. uh (laughs) So dumb. Just like this prediction. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Uh, But I love it. Okay. That's good. At least one other person does. So, (laughs) All right, so Captain Rhino also goes on to ask, um, which group in Jacob's Bill are you most looking forward to finding out about? (gasps) The lawyers. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, I want to know about these fucking lawyers so bad. <laughs> um, but for the ones in the vision, I'm interested in Johannes, obviously. I'm also interested in Maggie. Um, they they seem like the two kind of, I mean, like, honestly, all of them, but those are the mm-hmm. two that come to mind immediately. Um, and as for others, I'm really interested in the woman with the smudged face just because she reminded me so much of Miss, and that mm-hmm. might not be a thing, but um, she seems scary. The others were scared of her. They also ask, are there any types of practice that have only been lightly touched on in Pale, which you hope will make a big appearance in Pact, other than Karmic Law, of course? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so looking back through the domain text in Pale, the schools of realms stand out the most to me. Like we talked about, there's Dreamer of Paths. Sounds real cool. And then I I kind of want someone to write a rom-com between a Feywalker and a Warren Runner. I think that'd be really cute, like Romeo and Juliet style. Um, also reminds me of that one Avatar episode with like the two people in the ma- the magical sacred ball of whatever. Strong vibes. I feel like I'm not remembering what that is, but... um. It was the... I want to say the names of the tribes, and I don't remember. But it was, like, the the two tribes that hate each other, and they have to get through the canyon together. And then they, like, all bring food in, and they they all get attacked. And then Aang comes up with the story at the end where he's like, it was a game, and they were little children, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. It was, like, the Earth Kingdom, right, or... Yeah, I think it was... The first season, but yeah, they were trying to, yeah. I remember that. Okay. All right, I like it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Um, So that concludes our other verse-related questions. And now we're moving on to some parahumans questions. Just have a couple of them, basically. Yeah, we seem to have about three questions. So if you want to skip ahead um, a couple minutes, hopefully we won't spoil anything horribly. They're not super. Not super, super spoilery, but yeah. All right, starting now. Okay, so Flower <laughs> Priest asks, Jenny specifically, because Jenny's a nurse, what do you think of the description of Victoria's accumulating injuries and whether she might have lifelong complications as a result of her choices? You know, I feel like for all of Wild Bo stories that I've read, he's done a pretty good job at talking about injuries um, mm. and just... I feel there might. I feel like there was like one time, I don't remember which book it was. <laughs> I almost want to say Worm, where I kind of was like, oh yeah, right, that's not realistic. It was something about like <laughs> digging a bullet out or something. But again, it could be a character thing because if it was Taylor, I mean, she's a high schooler, and everybody's been told it's really important to get the bullet out no matter what you do. Let me just tell you guys, unless it's in a specific like. I don't know if it's like a wedge in your heart or if it's like in somewhere very vital and you need to get it out to, in order to like cauterize or like I don't know, stop the bleed somehow. It is not crucial to get the bullet out. It's not a life saving thing. You can leave that shit in there. In fact, I just had a patient a couple weeks ago. I work in a radiology department where we do procedures um, and we were placing, I think, like an NG tube or something. And while we were placing it, we found a bullet in this guy's butt that had been there since the 80s. Okay? He had been Did you shot. take it out? No. What? <laughs> because why would we take it out? It would do more, like, by that time, it would do more trauma to the patient to try to take that out. More risk for infection. Um, it healed up around it. Cool. Like, um, people, I mean, the main thing is, like, you need to know if you have that kind of a thing in there in case you need to get, like, an MRI. Because if you have any metal in your body, do not get an MRI. Or at least talk to the doctor. There might be specific things that are exceptions, but I'm sorry. I'll get along. I, I'll get on to the question now. <laughs> but just saying, that is, if someone got shot in front of you, do not try to dig that bullet out. I mean, they might get it out in the emergency room um, or in surgery, but depending on where it is, that's not unless like, it's John because it's a grave bullet. Yes, but that is probably not going to happen to you in real life, most likely. <laughs> So most likely you don't have to worry about it. That is not the part I rolled my eyes up, but. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. I'm sorry to the question. I feel like her descriptions of injuries were pretty darn accurate overall. Um, I, it was, I couldn't really go back to the descriptions specifically because Ward is 
well, pretty long and I couldn't remember where they were. <laughs> but as far as I can remember, they were pretty accurate. Um, man, in terms of lifelong complications, she's definitely going to have lifelong complications from that. Can you say chronic pain? <laughs> Holy crap. So <laughs> for anyone who's like, I don't know, gotten in, can say like sports related injuries or mm. like car accidents or anything, if you haven't been able to get that stuff like fully checked up on and treated, um, which in this post-apocalyptic world, I mean, they've got a lot of stuff, but I didn't really ever see her going and getting x-rays or like checking. She's kind of bulldozes her way through things, right? Mm -hmm. So she's going to keep going no matter if she's hurting. That's not really great for your body. (laughs) Um, So some possible things, depending on how much head trauma she's had. Um, (laughs) Like, well, she seems like she's had a good amount, you know, Mm -hmm. like, possibly some traumatic brain injury. Um, I don't know how much Amy's healed, but she could have cognitive decline as she gets older. Um, She could have just from banging up her body and like her, she could have joint pain, arthritis, um, possible nerve damage or pain. And a lot of that you won't necessarily feel when you're younger, um, but the older you get, your body's going to feel those residual effects from those injuries. And there's not really a good way to get rid of that. Um, and let's, you just get placed on, um, like some gabapentin or some kind of, uh, mm. medication for pain or, I mean, there's not really good ways. Could have untreated fractures, like just like little teeny fractures, um, that could heal improperly. Or maybe it's in a spot where like, you can't really put a cast on that. <laughs> um, like your tailbone can't really do anything for that. Mm. Um, if you have like spinal stress fractures, eventually can, I mean, you're not necessarily going to go paralyzed from having fractures in your back. You know, a lot of people actually walk around with fractures in their, in their back, <laughs> but, but you can get some serious chronic pain, some nerve issues, loss of feeling and limbs and things. So yeah, she's, she's not going to be feeling great basically when she gets older. <laughs> um, they're also asking, it looks like, uh, how accurate are Verona's symptoms of stress as they manifest in physical pain? I would say pretty darn accurate from what I know. Um, like, I mean, especially for somebody who blocks everything out mentally. So stress, I mean, stress is important, right? So it, <laughs> we were basically, stress is a survival strategy for short periods of time, right? So basically meant so that if we're being chased, by something or need to get out of danger. It gives us enough energy, adrenaline um, to get out um, and get to safety. Unfortunately, in the modern day, well, I mean, okay, it's, it's not unfortunate that we don't have to deal with that. But at the same time, um, the other things that cause us stress tend to cause chronic stress for mm. long periods of time. And that can take quite a toll on the body. So especially for somebody who's blocking out all the, like if she's blocking out all of her mental symptoms for most people, the mental symptoms are like so strong <laughs> that um, the, all your physical stuff's kind of secondary. Um, but if you're blocking everything mentally out, um, her physical symptoms are pretty on point hmm. um, for someone who's having like high level to panic attack levels of stress, like very accurate. All right. Cool. So, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully I, I tend to, I I tend to rant, but, you know, it happens. (laughs) Um, So Flower Priest also is asking for the lawyer. So Malia. um, Not a lawyer. Not not a lawyer. lawyer. (laughs) No. (laughs) But for the law student, what did you think of the legal system and the parahumans world, specifically how it dealt with offenders using powers or people who were discriminated against for even having powers? Um, I thought it was real interesting. I think I finished Ward slightly before starting law school. So I haven't, I, I'm not having a lot of like specific thoughts about, or like I haven't really, really thought about it. But the thing that stands out the most to me is just like the criminal justice system in Ward and how difficult that is in a world where like individuals have the dis- ability to destroy like millions of people's lives. And maybe like, like you maybe can't just put them in a box to stop that right i think it's really fortunate that we don't have that in our society that we don't have to deal with that especially considering how willing the united states is 
um, as somewhere where I live, to execute people for much less serious crimes, um, people who pose a much lower risk to others. We talk a lot in the criminal law about why do we have this? Um, is it preventative or is it punishment, right? Like, are we looking back when we're thinking about why we put people in jail or are we thinking forward? And I think that a lot of capes are good people and a lot of capes don't have the capacity to destroy the world. But for those that do, what do you do with them? It's really awful to think about. I also in Ward find the concept of like trying to build a legal system from scratch really interesting, especially in a world with parahumans and a world where a whole bunch of different governments and things have like become mixed into one being. Um, it was really neat seeing them build the huge mega city and everything like kind of impressive how they managed to do that. And like, I don't know. It seemed like people were trying to do the best they could, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's a rough situation to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So that is pretty much our parahumans questions right there. So we're going to move on to personal questions, which kind of personal, but also still involving these stories. So we're going to start with the person whose name I keep butchering. Tis a rat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so um, they ask, Malia, what's your favorite area of law so far? I came to law school to learn about refugee law. But since then, like my interest has spread out. So right now, I think I want to be like a civil rights litigator or maybe do some sort of policy work. I've really enjoyed all of my doctrinal classes. I didn't expect to, but I've enjoyed them all so far. I'm finishing my second year. So I got through all the like what else courses. Federal courts is probably my favorite class. It might be because I have a professor that I really, really love um, who makes, who's just really, I don't know, interesting. And yeah, I like him a lot. But uh, that's like one of the notoriously difficult classes of law school. I haven't taken my exam yet, so we'll see how I do. But it combines like conversations around like esoteric shit, like jurisdiction and like crap that like almost doesn't matter but maybe really does um <laughs> with stuff like being able to sue the government which super matters right mm. um and like we just the last couple days of class we spent talking about habeas corpus so like the power of the government to keep people imprisoned ah so it's a really broad class and i've really enjoyed it that sounds pretty cool i mean yeah. i don't know if i'd survive sitting in one of those classes but <laughs> When you talk about it, it sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then, Tis a Rot, Tis a Rat, Tis a Rat, <laughs> um, asks Jenny, what has been your favorite moment of humor derived from wrong or even right guesses that I have made so far? Man, I, I, love, I love them all, but <laughs> I mean, there's some that you've made that I can't mention because they have not come out to fruition yet but um i feel like my favorite one was the pokemon style familiars <laughs> being up in the tower that was amazing i was like yes <laughs> that was that was great um mm -hmm. yeah that made me like legitimately happy when you said that i was like that is just hilarious like are you thinking there's like a grass a water and a fire one or like you know, what kind of, what, what kind of styles are you thinking? <laughs> um, like oh, this, this conversation makes you want to go play Pokemon Snap. Jenny and I are fortunate <gasps> enough to have just, we just gotten... bought Pokemon <laughs> Snap. I'm yeah, I'm not going to lie, guys. It's pretty fun. They're um, so cute. There's something about it. It doesn't seem, I don't know. I feel like you've never played it. It doesn't sound like it's going to be an interesting game because you're taking pictures of Pokemon, but there's just something about it. That's really, really freaking fun. Yeah. My boyfriend's super into bird watching. And I'm like, this is like mm. bird watching, except I actually see all the Pokemon. I don't have great <laughs> eyes, so I often don't see the birds. <laughs> That's right. And you can keep going through the same path and try mm -hmm. to see like see them again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm probably gonna play that a little bit after we're done with this <laughs> recording, I'm not gonna lie. I also have to say <laughs> I really like the Malio's pretty close about Rose Sr. and um, Eamon. <laughs> she was guessing Laird. Close enough, you know? Like, 
close enough. <laughs> that was great. That was so weird. It was a little weird, but um, it was hilarious. All right, next person, Beleg Tal. Sorry if I butchered that, but that's what I'm going with. <laughs> they were asking, what are your favorite books slash stories outside the Wild Bow canon? Um, so my favorite author is Jane Austen. Um, I've read all of her novels. She's so good. I really, it sucks that she died fairly, like relatively young because I need to read more. Um, mm. I also love The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, um, Discworld by Terry Pratchett. Tamora Pierce was a really formative author of my childhood. The Protector of the Small Quartet is my favorite of her series. Um, and then also The Enchanted Forest Chronicles by Patricia C. Reedy. I was kind of proposing them as a podcast to Jen before we realized that this was probably a better idea. Um, we devoured them as children. Like we had mm -hmm. to buy new copies of the books because they all fell apart. Did we um, actually buy new copies? I mean, I... I I want to say yes, but like I actually, when we were talking about it, when I was like, I kind of want to make a podcast, I bought actual new copies because I'm oh. like, these books. Because last time I went home and oh, no. <laughs> I read them again because Malia's right. That was probably two, three years ago. And I mean, you could still read them, but they were falling apart for oh, sure. No. <laughs> they're just um, fun to read. They're so good. And I, but yeah, I also heard her last name, Reedy, was sort of a disappointment because growing up, I always thought it was Patricia C. Red. And I was like, the, the name of the podcast can be Patricia We Read. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. Bummer. Uh, bummer. And then I also love The Lord of the Rings, especially the movies. I'm also two thirds of the way through The Silmarillion. I've been reading it for a year and a half and <laughs> maybe I'll finish it. <laughs> hey, you, you probably will someday. Yeah. <laughs> As for me. Yeah, I like fiction and nonfiction stories. Um, I actually, I mean, I mean, I haven't read Wheel of Time or Discworld yet, but it, like, I've heard that they're really, really good. So, I read, um, I think the first book um, of Mistborn, um, mm -hmm. which is really good. Um, Rando pretty, Sando, solid. Yes, um, relatively recently. I, I should lend you. Sorry, I should lend no. you Warbreaker. That's my favorite Brando Sando book. It's real good. Hmm. All right, I'm. I mean, I'm down. I'll take some stuff. There's a, <laughs> there's a a Reddit serial that has been published on Amazon that I've been reading that I actually bought because I really liked it so much. It's called "This Quest Is Bullshit." Um, <laughs> highly recommend. It's hilarious. It's very very funny. But I've I've read a few nonfiction things um, relatively recently too that I'd recommend. Um, let's see. More recently, read "Devil in the White City." Have you read that, Malia? Mm -mm. No, okay. It's basically probably not surprised that I'd be interested in this after the description, but um, it's kind of a it's a nonfiction story. Um, it's in a novel style. It's about the 1893s World Fair um, in Chicago, and H. H. Holmes, who is a serial killer, active around the same time, <laughs> and I'm currently reading um, the Graves Are Walking which is a historical account of the Irish potato famine, which is really, hmm. really well-written as well. Um, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Cool. Beleg Tall also asks, are the Otherverse and Parahuman stories similar to the kinds of books you would otherwise read? Hilariously enough, um, I mean, it's not that hilarious. I don't know. I was going to say funny enough, but I was like, oh, I'll say hilarious, but that's, that's not that funny. <laughs> um, no, I do like fantasy a lot, but... Um, I don't tend to read works as dark as, like, the other verse and parahuman stories. I probably, if I knew they were this dark, I wouldn't have assumed that I would like them. But, mm. I mean, we're doing a podcast about it, so kind of obsessed. Right. And then Jenny says that, but also she, like, reads nonfiction accounts of serial killers, which okay, would... Okay, not um... all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Keep me up at night. <laughs> okay, not all the time. And I haven't read it in a while. I actually haven't read anything like that, like, since having Nico, probably because it's a little bit closer to home in terms oh. of, like, well, I mean, maybe that's not the correct term because I haven't had any dealings with serial killers in my real life. <laughs> but just having a kid, I'm like, ugh, that's, like, the last thing I want to even, like, entertain thinking about, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, like, Albert Fish, don't read about that guy, especially if you have kids. Okay. Yeah. So, 
I don't really want to read about stuff like that um, at the moment. So <laughs> there are some monsters out there. Fortunately, not very many, hopefully, but um, there are some terrible people out there. What about you, Malia? Yeah, I similarly don't really read things this dark. Usually if I'm picking a book to read, it's going to be a fantasy novel, which mom is still frustrated with. She's always like, read books for adults. And I'm like, Haha, they are. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm not really into superheroes. Um, so like, Worm's like the only superhero thing I'm real into. Hmm. The other verse is more my speed. But yeah, I mean, I guess it's weird that I say Jane Austen's my favorite author, but also I read fantasy. But she's so freaking, she's incredible. I mean, she's pretty legit. Yeah. The Bee Vampire asks, Jenny, as a parent, what are your thoughts on the parents in Wild Bo's stories, such as Danny, Carol, Brett, Jasmine, or Avery's parents? Do any of them particularly resonate with or interest you positively or negatively? All right. So rating from best to worst in terms of the people you mentioned, Jasmine's the best. Then Avery's parents. Danny's kind of in the middle for me. Then Carol and then Brett. Carol's pretty damn terrible. Oh, Carol. I mean, it's like, she's actually pretty close with Brett. But Do you think she think, gets better, though? I feel like she gets better. I don't... Yeah, I don't but... Man, she fucked up so fucking bad. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's just... Okay, so the ones that really resonate, or like interest me, as you say, I just have more of a reaction to the really shit ones. Because... Mm. Man, it's just like, you are being such, you're hurting your kids so much. Like, do you know, like, how do you not know what you're doing? And I mean, granted, no one really knows what they're doing when they're becoming a parent. But like, man, it's like almost kind of malicious. Like you're, it's like, how how, how are you not doing this intentionally? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a small follow up. They also ask, did you read Worm before having a child? And if so... Has becoming a parent altered how you view Danny or other fictional parents in general? So I did read Worm before um, I had my son. I'm trying to remember when I first read Worm, but it was New Year's Eve, twenty seventeen. Okay, how do you know that? <laughs> because I was with. That's when we went to Katie's <laughs> wedding, and her their wedding was on New Year's Eve. And Andrew and I, I think, were like talking about it, and we're like hey, you need to read this. And we were like lying down in the hotel room that we were sharing. And I was like, hey, what arc are you on? And you were like, arc 13, except it wasn't uh, that far. Yeah. But you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, Malia knows. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So I read Burn before I had my son. But so it's kind of interesting because on one hand, I'm more critical of the mistakes that are being made. Um, and it's more obvious how... They're really fucking up. Um, yeah. On the other hand, um, as I kind of, as I mentioned, you don't magically start to know what you're doing once you just pop out a kid. Um, like, hopefully you try to get prepared um, mm -hmm. by either reading books or just talking to people or like, you know, hopefully you do some kind of preparation, but it's really hard to be. You can't really be 100% prepared because um, every kid's different, too. So I have, I feel like I have more sympathy for Danny um, than I did before. And I, I'm sympathetic to Avery's parents in particular, because you can tell that they, they love their kids. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing the best that they can um, with minimal outside support. And Danny's been through hell. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't imagine what it'd be like to lose your spouse. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously he really needed to step it up more than he did, but like, it's he didn't I don't think he really had any other outside support and that that really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Avery's parents, especially her mom, is just fantastic. Um, and they're just kind of like I feel like if they had less kids, um, mm -hmm. I mean, they would they'd be right up there with Jasmine, I would mm -hmm. think, or at least close. But there's so many of them. It's hard to <laughs> it's hard to really pay every like attention as much as they need to. I was trying to think, I think Matt said it on, um, I don't remember if it was on We've Got Worm or We've Got Ward, but he was <laughs> said something along the lines of basically try to get through parenting with like the least amount of trauma to your kids as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or like least amount of like fucking up your kids, which is kind of true. Um, cause unfortunately like there's 
going to be something that you do that's probably going to stick with them and you don't know what it is. (laughs) Like, it could be a comment you kind of, like, throw offhand and um, don't really think about and they're Mm -hmm. just going to remember it for the rest of their life. I'm not really at that point yet because my kiddos, too... I mean, I mean, who knows? Maybe I am at that point. I've really screwed him up already. But I don't think so. But yeah, parenting's it's interesting. Let me see. So, still the be vampire um, for Malia. How has creating the podcast been so far? Um, it's been really fun. It's really neat learning about audio editing. It's like a new skill. Weird things you don't necessarily think about, like finding the music was kind of tricky, and learning about like podcast hosting and all of it. Mm. But it's something I'm really enjoying. It's a nice escape and it's a good way of like procrastinating while being productive. Like if I'm like, oh, I have to work on that essay. I'm like, well, I could edit the podcast because I got to do it. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. that's fun. (laughs) So they also ask any expectations or surprises you'd like to share? Yeah, the biggest surprise has been the amount of engagement we received. I don't know if you agree, Jen. I'm curious to hear. Yeah, yeah I do. your take on these as well. But we're super fortunate that like Doof Media exists and does Wild Bow podcasts because they did a lot of the work, you know, creating this community and just like the Reddit page and other people out there who really like love Wild Bow and crave the content. But yeah, they were really like welcoming and excited about our project. And if not for them, I don't think we'd necessarily have the audience to do things like discussion questions um, or like this Q&A episode. So that's kind of the biggest surprise. Yeah. Um, no, I totally agree. Like, I'm not going to lie. Malia's she's doing most of the work. for this. <laughs> like she's doing, um, all the editing. Um, she's in charge of, has been in charge of like uploading the podcast and stuff like, which I'm very grateful for. Thank you. For that. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I was just hoping we'd have a few listeners. Um, mm-hmm. I've kind of been very pleasantly surprised that people have been listening and actually seem to like what we're doing. So Mm -hmm. thank you guys for listening. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Duke Media, man, you guys are awesome. You're like, I mean, we sent y'all an email, emailed back super quickly, gave a lot of good tips. So yeah, much thanks. And we need to send you guys a card. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That's right. And I can make a card. It's going to be wonderful. Okay. I probably shouldn't yes. say that because it's from the like, heart, but it's going to be from the heart. So even if it doesn't look good, you can't say <laughs> that because it's going to be from the heart. Okay. It, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's going to look good. Don't it's worry about it. Look- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, all right. Next question um, from hero of old iron. What is your favorite sandwich? I just had a pork belly bond me for dinner it was real good you we like you know there's like the lettuce and the like pickled carrots and like the Mm. and it was like this marinated like pork belly so it was like kind of like swedish and it had like jalapeno on the sandwich and it was like the nice like french bread and you take it and you dip it into the pho that you're eating because why not oh and like Mm. like a chili pepper sauce stuff i don't think i've ever dipped bond me into pho before but yeah, um, my boyfriend taught me, and yeah. it's real good. Is that how you're supposed to eat it? Because I feel like I've gotten bond me before and have not been I don't think pho. you're supposed to eat it that oh, way. But he always just... orders pho and a bond me. So, uh, um, okay. Yeah. Where'd you guys go? Some Austin place that's amazing, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's called Sip Pho. It's actually so good. It's right ne- near campus, and it's new, and it's real good. Well, that sounds delicious. I yeah, do like plug for <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because, <laughs> you know, people always get mixed up, like, how to pronounce pho. They're like, is it pho? Is it pho? You know how I remember? How? Because legitimately, in my, I used to go to UC Davis in California. Um, there was a restaurant called Pho King. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, I mean, that settles it. I mean, it has to be pronounced pho. <laughs> or this wouldn't be funny. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the only way it makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's, what's your favorite sandwich? Uh, I I mean, the one, I mean, Bon Me is a pretty solid choice for sure. But I don't know, like every time I see a Caprese sandwich, mm-hmm. especially if it has pesto on it, on mm-hmm. a menu, that's kind of what I gravitate to getting because yeah. those are amazing. Yeah. I just love those. So much cheese. 
<laughs> cheese and tomato goodness. <sighs> yes. Okay, so they also ask, most of what we get, in pale at least, seems to be drawn from Western, European, or Solomonic traditions. There's a little bit of Eastern, quote-unquote, traditions, but usually that's just like the only thing. So... Is there a specific cultural approach to the practice that you'd like to see? Honestly, for me, um, I i mean, it might just be where we grow up, but I feel like it'd be great to see some Pacific Islander stuff. Um, yeah. Specifically, like Hawaiian culture would be great. Um, I wouldn't be too picky, though. Any Pacific Islander would be really interesting. There's a lot of different gods and mythology. Um, I know in Hawaii and all across like Pacific, um, that would be really interesting to cover. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, that's, that'd be my choice. What about you? Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm also interested in, like, other Native American stuff. Uh, I Like, the thing is, I feel like that's really complicated and tricky to maybe get into. And, like, it is mm-hmm. often done poorly. Mm-hmm. Like, that being said, I'm really excited about this First Nations woman in Pact. Because I'm just, like, really excited to see where she goes and if any cool, like, practicey stuff comes from her. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they also ask any specific kinds of others you'd like to see. Yeah. So there's this um, legal fiction kind of the reasonable man. It's supposed to like substitute for an objective test. So I think about it in like tort negligence. Right. So like if it was reasonable for a person to act in a certain way, like they can't be negligent. So you think like, would a reasonable person have done this? And you're like, I don't fucking know. But like you make juries decide that all the time. So I think that like near courthouses and like around juries, there are a lot of like reasonable people like <laughs> that manifest. Um, and I think that'd be fun. What about yeah, you? Pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. The first one, don't hate me because <laughs> it's going to be stuck in my head forever. <laughs> I'm like, should I even sing this right now? Sing it. <laughs> all right. So this is the chorus, guys. So. Mischievous, marvelous, magical Maui, hero of this land, the one, the only, the ultimate Hawaiian Superman. Yeah, that was, uh, I should never have done that. I regret everything immediately. Yeah. (laughs) So I I know you guys are kind of familiar with Maui from Moana. It's same God, but less goofy, (laughs) essentially. (laughs) Uh, now he's a you trickster. So. Maui kind of no, okay. Well, he's a trickster, but like I feel like you can be a trickster and not feel like you're. I don't know. I feel like the vibe I got from Moana's Maui is more like a. I'm a goofball who's like mm. gonna fuck shit stuff up a little bit more. Maybe like not on purpose, you know. <laughs> Where is Maui? He's a trickster, but like more like a. I feel like he's more similar to Loki, in terms mm. of like he's clever. Um, right as he's super to, competent he's very competent so possibly maui Ugh, i'm regretting but you guys should but that's a, actually a song um hawaiian superman Breta is so look it up it's real good it's real good um or night marchers would be super yes. cool i would love to see wild Bo's take on night marchers well please google night marchers <laughs> that would be amazing so night marchers basically are um ghost warriors essentially like mm-hmm. that kind of travel across the islands mm-hmm. usually at least on maui like we always just used to say they're up in the mountains um and i feel like some people some people have said you can see lights um mm-hmm. but like mostly you hear like a drum you feel mm-hmm. like someone beating a drum they're ghost like ancient hawaiian warriors essentially and they might march over you if you sleep and if they do that you won't be able to breathe and it sucks um there's much more to it but <laughs> part of it is like your feet facing the door or whatever makes it like more likely that they'll come get you yeah I, I feel like there's like a couple things with your feet facing the door but yeah like not supposed to sleep with your feet facing the door because yeah my, night marcher is going to come march over you and you can't breathe um but um i feel like there's some other things to that too it's just kind of bad luck of mm-hmm. course my my bed always was the one or my feet were facing the door so thanks parents <laughs> um i never got marched on or at least i don't remember it so i blocked it out yeah i I was the scaredy child and don't know that I could have like necessarily dealt with that. Um, 
when I was uh, fair enough. when I was 16 years old, I read Agatha Christie's and then there were none. Such um, a good book. Really good book. And yet I did not sleep. Mom had to come sleep on our floor while I was 16 oh. years old. And I stayed up and read The Protector of the Small Quartet until the sun rose. <laughs> Which is another shocking thing as to why she's doing this podcast. Like, what I are you deal doing? With it. It's not scary so far. <laughs> yeah. Um every chapter Jen's like, you know, you can read this one at night or like whatever. <laughs> like we haven't gotten to anywhere. She's like, don't read this at night yet. But yeah. I'm reading. <laughs> I mean the pizza one I said don't read at night. Oh, that's true. I was like, you know, it's gonna freak you out. Ooh, we're at our last question. Yay! Woo-hoo! Um, Napalm Eagle. They are asking, are you planning to cover Miles End or any other packed ice material? I honestly hadn't even thought about it, but that's yeah, such same. a fun idea. Um, we'd have to wait to the end of Pact, so we'll probably kind of see as we're getting closer to the end if we feel up to it. But I have read at least most of Miles End. I don't know if I got the last couple sessions, but I've read most of it. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, we'll probably... S- I don't know about if you agree, Malia, but I think probably see how we're doing towards the end of this. Yeah. Um, and see if we're up for it. Yeah, um, I think it could be fun. Yeah. Um, I'm worried about spoilers, so I haven't touched any of that stuff yet. But yeah. Probably a good idea, just in case. Yeah, yeah. I'm down. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to support Wildbo as he continues to write fantastic stories, go to patreon.com slash Wildbo. You can follow the pod on Twitter at Pale Comparison or send us an email at paleincomparisonpod at gmail.com. In addition, if you'd like to see all of my predictions laid out, check out our episode description for a link to a prediction tracker. Fun fact for the week, dolphins have known to chew on pufferfish to get high. Have a good one, guys. Bye.